the Lord. All right. Well, guys, this morning we're going to revisit some things that we talked about some time ago in a, a training class session that we did, and it was based upon the book by John Bevere entitled The Bait of Satan. Um, we're going to take a look at some things this morning that were not necessarily covered, um, just to give us some new insight on what all that means. Most of you probably can bear witness to the fact that one of the, one of the things that, that we as believers really have to keep a very close watch on is our relationships with each other. Uh, because it's the, the folks a lot of times that are closest to us that can tend, if we don't watch it, to throw a monkey wrench in the things that God has planned for us. Amen? Amen. So we're going to, like I said, revisit these things and uh, help you to be aware, as if you aren't already, of some of the things that can occur if we don't watch ourselves. So to start off, we'll take a look at Luke 17, 1. That's Luke 17, 1. And it reads, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. In other words, it is impossible to live in this life for there not to be, and it's not an opportunity to become offended, <laughs> But we will be presented with those situations where offense is prevalent. The thing we have to be mindful of is that we are expected and uh, called upon to make sure that we engage ourselves and stay engaged in the love of God. Now notice I said in the love of God and not in your love, right? Because whenever the exchange was made in terms of us accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he gave us his love. He gave us his love. So it's in, it's, it is expected for us to walk in his love at all times. Right. Amen? Because Amen. we're gonna look at some scriptures today that will, that will definitely bear that out. Now, in, in that verse that we just read, the word offenses, uh, the Greek word for offend in Luke 17.1 comes from the word scandalon. This word originally referred to the part of the trap to which the bait is attached. The word signifies laying a trap in someone's way. Now, the, the bait is placed in the trap, right? I, you know, in, in preparing for this, I took a look at, at something here and I actually went out to the, the website, Victor. They are the makers of the mousetrap. And I found some very uh, interesting things on that website. Now, um, they listed like seven things to avoid, but I didn't do all seven. I just picked out some ones here that I found to be very interesting. And we'll take a look at these things as they correlate with the scriptures that we're going to look at. The first thing is, 
uh, you use the wrong food instead. In other words, one of the mistakes is that people use the wrong food. Instead, pick bait that mice crave. Forget about the cartoon caption that says that mice eat cheese or they eat cheese. Really, mice prefer peanuts or in this case peanut butter or nuts, right? And one of the things that, that they will do is they will seek out those things. I mean, they don't, they don't really like other things because used to people would, would use meat or, or whatever, but no, they, will, they, will, they love nuts because that's what they eat in, in the wild. So their hunger for calories also entices them to try chocolate, right? So one of the other ones, it says, this is a mistake. You use too much bait. Instead, use only a tiny amount. When you load up mouse traps with a lot of bait, the pests can steal some of it without getting caught in the trap. A pea-sized amount of mouse, of mouse trap bait is just right, enough to attract the mice, but not so much that they can eat it without springing the trap. Now keep this stuff in mind, all right? One of the other ones, you expect instant results. Instead, make them comfortable first. Mice are naturally wary of new objects in the areas they frequent. You can acclimate them by putting out baited and used mouse trap and unset mouse traps, excuse me, for a few days. Whether you are using classic snap mouse traps, electronic mouse traps, or live traps, once you see the mice taking the, the mouse trap bait, you know that the mouse traps are in the right place and that the pests will return to them. Then it's time to set the trap. <laughs> Just, we're going somewhere with this, you watch. All right, the last one that I uh, picked here. You set the trap in the wrong place. Instead, go to the wall. And basically what that's saying is put it where the mice travel. That's right. And what it was saying there is that they, are, they don't like open spaces. They like to go around the perimeters of the wall because their whips help them navigate around. So you always put it where they travel. Now, getting back to the word. <laughs> Guys, one of, the, one of the things that we, that we have to understand is a trap is something that someone is emotionally or cultural, culturally tied to, right? Okay, so the trap is there, and usually what is set is something that this, this person is attracted to, something that they are familiar with, something that they habitually do, something that they are used to doing, things that they crave. Now understand, these things that I'm talking about have to do with the old man. They have to do with the old man. We are commanded by the word of God that we must renew our minds. We are also reminded in the word of God that we are indeed new creatures. So as a new creature, we can no longer embrace the things that we once did in our old lives, being and becoming a new creature. Now let's look at something here. And we'll get deeper in, into this hopefully after we read this scripture. And look at this in 1 John 2. 15 through 17. We're going to look at a, at a couple of scriptures here in, in 1 John and then in Matthew. 
uh, Romans and Colossians, but I'll tell you those here in just a moment. Because you can't, you can't, you can't be a new creature, but then allow yourselves to be attracted and taken up by the things of the world. Right? First John 2. First John 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's craving for sensual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen? Amen. Now, one of the things that we have to be mindful of here is that after becoming new creatures, we understand that whenever we were born in the world, in fact, uh, David alluded to this, he says, we are born in sin and shapen in iniquity, mm -hmm. right? That was whenever we were born the first time through the womb of our mother. So then later, thank God for Jesus, Christ, he came along, and he made a way for a new birth to take place. And Paul picked it up in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now that word passed away is a forensic word in the sense that it means that when someone passes away, they no longer exist physically in this world. You don't, you're not going to see them physically walking around anymore because they have passed away, right? So we have to reckon or count our old lives, the first birth and all of its activities to be passed away because God no longer looks at us based upon the first life. He looks at us based upon the new life. So because he looks at us that way, we have to look at ourselves that way as well. Now, one of the things, <clears throat> and there are many, but one of the things that is prevalent, I believe, in this society, and unfortunately it has leaked or leached into the church, is a whole cultural thing that people are so enamored with. What do I mean by that? I'm glad you asked. One of the things that the Lord shared with me some time ago is that whenever we are become new creatures in Christ, there are certain categories or delineations that are made based upon one's culture, based upon the color of one's skin, based upon even one's gender. And let me tell you what I'm talking about. In the world, they will give statistics about diseases. And they will say this particular disease afflicts or affects as they say it, black men, this age, uh, so forth and so on. And then they name all of the things that are associated with that, right? They also name other quote unquote races that, you know, where things are 
apply to them as well. Then they list these whole, all of these, these things, right? The wonderful thing that I'm so happy about is that when Jesus made me a brand new creature, do you realize that those things no longer apply to me? Let me say that again. I heard about two or three people <laughs> responding to that, and I just want to say it again so you can hear what I'm saying. Whenever you became a new creature in Christ, all of the things that they announced and pronounced about you in terms of what your so-called race or gender are, right? They listed those things, and they pretty much said, if you fall in this category, then these things apply to you. Well, I'm here to tell you that that is not what God says. And because God does not say that, I am not going to be caught or I'm not going to be baited or placed in the trap where that thing is concerned. Now, how do you catch yourself or how do you find yourself in that trap? Well, you do it by focusing on what the world says and not what the Word of God says. Mm -hmm. Did you realize that whenever you focus on that, that you love that? Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. I mean, I, I want to say it again. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Whenever you focus on that mm -hmm. more than what the Word of God says, that you love that. That's right. <laughs> now, let me tell you this. What I'm sharing with you today, it's not about guilt and condemnation. Nothing about that. It is about making you aware so that you can reevaluate how you're thinking. That's all. That's all I'm doing. So when you understand the fact that God has pronounced you as someone who can access health, then you need to be shouting about that. <laughs> and whenever you do that, you have got to understand that whenever he pronounces that upon you, that you cannot, let me say it again, that you cannot be diagnosed. Amen. Let me say that one more time. I, now, I, I'm repeating myself, not because I forgot what I said. But I'm repeating myself because I want you to understand what I'm saying. Whenever God says you are healed and you have the opportunity and the privilege to walk in health, you need to gravitate towards. That's what you need to receive, not the other stuff. Because in your new birth, you don't have that. And by virtue of you not having that, you should not ever claim something as yours. Well, my high blood pressure. Well, my, my diabetes. And my, my hard of hearing. And my stiff leg. No. No, that's not what God said about you. So anything that God does not say about you, then you should not agree with. Because whenever you were born naturally, there were certain things that, as they say, ran in your family. Yes. <laughs> but now that you are a member of the family of God, it stopped running. Amen. Where you're concerned. Hallelujah. I said where you're concerned. Amen. So that's what you have got to focus your attention on. That's what you have got to be You've, that's what you have to fall in love with. Because there is nothing good, virtuous, lovely of good report about any of those things. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> I hope you're understanding what I'm saying here. Now, in um, Matthew 10... Thirty-four and thirty through thirty-seven, and now we have to understand this as well. 
and I'll use, I'll use myself as an example here. And then we'll get to the scripture. Whenever I became, or when, whenever I began to understand the things that God had called me into by receiving the truth of the word of God, there, were, there was a decision that came with that. That decision had to do with the fact of, am I going to receive what the Word of God says, or am I going to cling to things that the family has said and the family believed and all this kind of stuff? And in doing that, whenever that decision is made, what also comes with that decision is the possibility that they're not going to want to speak to you or they're going to think that you're strange or all of this kind of stuff. And if you don't watch yourself, you will find yourself not aligning yourself with what the Word of God says because you don't want to hurt their feelings or you don't want to be disowned. It really comes to that. I said it really comes to that. Case in point. I remember that I was, uh, I was sharing something with a relative. In fact, it was an aunt. And uh, I just told her what the Word of God said. Because listen, you don't ever want to know what somebody's opinion is. Because an opinion is not going to save you. The Word of God can if you apply it to your life. Yes. But anyway, um, I went on to tell the person, you know, my, what the Word of God says. And she got so mad that she just got up and just stormed out of the room, stomping and everything. Now, <laughs> before, I started, before I started sharing that, the, the thought was, was in my mind. Now, you know if you do that, you're going to make her mad, right? <laughs> you know that, don't you? But guess what? It didn't matter. Because I would much rather someone to be mad now and, and uncomfortable throughout eternity. Because we can't go before God and say, well, Lord, I would have uh, shared that with them, but they would have got mad. And uh, they wouldn't have invited me to dinner anymore or over to their house. And he would and he'd say, well, what's, what does that have to do with what I told you? Because you got to understand what's at stake is not their relationship with you. What's at stake is their soul. Because the relationship with you, that, that, that's, that's, you know, farther down the road. That, that's not that important in the larger scheme of things. What's more important is that they hear the truth and the truth that they hear making them free. Because when you see it that way, you will look through all of the antics and you will see what is really important. Amen? Amen? Now let's continue reading here in Matthew, or let's start reading. In Matthew 10, in verse 34 it reads, <clears throat> Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Look at this. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Is Jesus 
a, pe a peace breaker? One person answered, let me ask you again. Is Jesus a peace breaker? No. So when he talks about the fact that he came to set a man at variance, what is he talking about? That was a question you can answer. What is he talking about? Yes. You're going to have trouble when you serve God. Okay, that, that's along the path. Go ahead. Set apart. Okay. One more and I'll tell you. Yes. His point is that he is the peace, so there's no earthly or fleshly establishment that can come between he and so that's his point was to come and break that so that you gravitate towards him who is the peace. Okay. The truth. I kind of gave you an example when I was talking about the relative. Amen. By virtue of my decision to speak the truth, that set her not against me, but against the word of God. Right. See? Listen, when you represent God and you do what God says, if a person rejects that, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. He'll tell you just like he told uh, Samuel, I believe it was, whenever the people wanted a king. And Samuel told him, listen, you don't want that. And the Lord said, listen, Samuel. They're not rejecting, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So don't even, don't even take it personally whenever you know that you are doing exactly what God told you to do. If he, if he, if he told you to tell someone something or share his word with someone, mm -hmm. you need, that's exactly what you need to do. You need to do it the way he says for you to do it. I said, you need to do it the way he says for you to do it. Because when you do it the way that he says for you to do it, then you have discharged your obedience where he's concerned. And then it's up to that person to do the word that you minister to them. So you can't, you can't, you can't take this thing personally. Because in, in many cases, you may have to separate yourself from your family members for a while. And go back and save them later. In the meantime, pray, as he says, to the Lord of the harvest. That he would do what? Send forth labors into the harvest. In other words, that there will be people that will witness to them the truth of the word of God. Because in a lot of cases, guys, you, and you probably have come across this as well, whenever you begin to understand the Word of God and you begin to share these things with your family members, it can get a little dicey. <laughs> it, in fact, it can get a lot dicey. For them, not for you. Because they're the ones that need the truth so that they can be made free. Because listen, whenever I understand that whenever Jesus was on that cross and he took upon himself every curse. In fact, in Colossians 2, it talks about um, he took upon him all of things that were written against us and contrary to us. It was contrary to the way that God created us to walk in sickness and disease. It was contrary. If God had wanted sickness and disease, he would have made it in, in the garden. Because there's no way that he looked at Adam with one eye lower than the other, one leg shorter than the other, and said, behold, that's good. <laughs> he didn't do that. Everything that he made from the beginning, he said, wow, this is very good. This is outstanding. I like this. Amen? So everything that God, whenever he did it, we need to look back to the beginning so that we can latch onto that and understand that that is what his intent was. Not the way that things are, but the way that they were from the very beginning. Amen? Amen. So, whenever he
talks about this, we have to understand, number one, Jesus is not a peace breaker. By virtue of you standing for the word of God, it means that your standards are those that are set in the word of God. And if people don't like that, that's not your issue. Because you have to represent God, period. Period. Now you would hope that they would, you know, accept what his word is saying. You would hope that. But if they don't, you cannot get all emotional engaged in that. Because if you do that, you will be getting in God's way. Your hands are, are not on it. I mean, your hands are on it. Mm -hmm. And as long as you meddling and poking with, with stuff, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. And you can't blame God for it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's look at um, Colossians 3. beginning at verse 5. And bef bef before we get there, you don't have to, you don't have to turn to this, but I, I'm just, I just want you to, to read it, or I want you to hear this. It's in Ephesians 5, 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. It is expected of us to know what the will of God is for us. Amen? Amen. And we have no excuse not to know what the will of God is. All right, Colossians 3, beginning at verse 5. I'm reading in the um, NIV, beginning at verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Once again, because those things whenever people focus on those things, that means they love those things. All right? Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Look at this key thing right here. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, wrath, or it, it says your rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised, or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. One of the things that we also have to watch, guys, is to fall in the trap and be baited with the whole idea of pitting races against each other. Because whenever, as far as God is concerned, there is no black or white. There is no um, uh, Hispanic or Greek. There's none of that. See, I got one thank you. I said whenever we are born again, those things do not exist for us to the point that we make differences or we treat people differently based upon the shade of their skin. Do you realize that God intended for those things to bring us together as opposed to driving us apart? So whenever you sense that that is trying to operate in your life, 
you can rest assured that that is from the devil. I said you can rest assured that that is from the devil. Because in God, there is no such thing. Do you think that there's going to be a side of heaven for uh, the whites or the blacks or the Hispanics or for the Chinese or the Japanese or uh, Filipino? No. No. We're all going, well, let me, let me put to, the, to you this way. The people that get there are going to be together. Because if you're down here thinking, well, I'm going to be on that side and they're going to be on that side. Uh-uh. It's not happening. It is not happening. You know, it's, it reminds me of the um, parable where uh, the rich man and Lazarus died. I'm not talking about the Lazarus that Jesus raised. This was another one. Whenever they died, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom and the Bible says a rich man lifted up his eyes in hell and he said to Abraham, Father Abraham, allow Lazarus to come and dip his finger in water and put it on my tongue it, because it's hot down here basically and I'm being tormented in these, frame, in these flames. And Abraham said, son, remember in the first life, in life, you receive good things and Lazarus evil. And then he went on to say, even if I could allow that to happen, there is a great gulf fixed between me and thee so that I can't come to you and you can't come to me. So in other words, tough. Too bad. See? So, it's, it's, a, it's a thing to where we have just got to be very mindful. We have got to apply the love of God and the Word of God in our lives every day because this is not something that you get overnight. It doesn't fall on your lap like a wet noodle. You have to actively engage in walking in the love of God. It does not matter, listen, wow. It does not matter that you've been mistreated. You still don't have the right to hold on to offense and walk in offense. Because how many of you know that it is impossible for you to take poison and kill the other person? <laughs> Because people think, now nah, nah, I'm about to say this, it, it, but it's where we live. I ain't talking to that old helpful. She mistreated me. I, I'm not going to say anything to her. I'm not going to speak to her. I'm going to just love her from a distance. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's not possible. I said it's not possible. Because you have to ask yourself, does God hold anything against me? Wow, two people. Let me ask you again. You can, you can, you can participate. Does God hold anything against me? No. No. Now watch this. Should I hold anything against anybody? No. Now, have you ever seen that Toyota commercial where the guy is sitting at the table and uh, he said, now I have a poker face. And he looks at the deal and he's doing all this. I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed. But he keeps the poker face. Now, whenever this is happening, whenever things are done to you, your flesh is screaming. It is jumping up and down. It is acting crazy. But don't give in to that. You allow the word of God. You say, shut up and sit down. You're not doing that. I walk in the love of God. I walk in the power of God. 
And while I'm saying that, don't let anything ever steal your joy. I think it was Jerry Savelle wrote a book some years ago. It was entitled, If Satan Can't Steal Your Joy, He Can't Have Your Goods. <laughs> and, and now the, the stuff that I'm talking about, it has, it has taken on shoe leather. You know what I mean? You wear it. You actively engage yourselves in it. You have to, listen. You can, hear, you can hear the word of God all day. You can confess the word of God all day. But until you do it, it is not going to benefit you one bit. Whenever it's time to walk in it, you can't shrivel and, and shrink back from it. You've got to actively engage yourself in it. Because stuff, listen, the stuff is coming. Jesus said it was coming. The storm, as he talked about in that, in that parable, the storm came at, with the same velocity for the one who built his, rock, his house upon the rock as well as it did for the one that built it on the sand. It came this, it the same way. But one that built his house upon the rock was able to stand because he was founded on a rock. He was founded on a stable foundation. Anytime that we allow ourselves to fall victim to offense, then our foundation has become that of sand. We have to make sure that we apply the love of God to our lives each and every day. Not, again, not our love. Amen? Amen? All right. So, offense, as I mentioned, usually stalks the closest relationships. Those who we sit with, sing alongside, or perhaps it is the one delivering the sermon. We spend holidays, attend social functions, and share offices with them, or perhaps it's closer. We grow up with, confide in, and sleep next to them. The closer the relationship, the more severe the offense. The greatest hatred is usually between those who were close. And that fact is, is borne out in, um, unfortunately, some divorces where people were once very close. But whenever stuff happens in this, unfortunately, they just go off the deep end. Unfortunately. But I'm here to tell you that we have access to the love of God and the power of God that is able to keep us if we, if we will allow ourselves to be kept. Because just as sure as I'm standing here and you're sitting out there, there are going to be times whenever things are going to present themselves before us and we're going to have to make sure that we stay engaged in the love of God. That is a choice that we make. Because the decision should have already been made. We have to do it. At all costs. Because once again, you cannot take poison and, and, and expect for the other person to be harmed. That's just not how that works. And the thing about it is, <clears throat> I'm not giving glory to the enemy. However, you have to be mindful of his tactics. You have to be. You can't be taken, taken by surprise with any, anything that, that happens. Anything that comes to kill, steal, and destroy is not of God. And you have to recognize that for what it is. Anything that comes to kill, steal, and destroy, you can't accept that. You have to resist that. But your resistance, or your, rather, your uh, submission to God and His Word will determine the level of resistance that you're able to walk in. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.
verses 1 through 5. Second Timothy three, one through five. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. <clears throat> For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Anybody, anybody that will accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior in believing that once they become new creatures in Christ, their old life has passed away, if they fail to apply that same principle to their life each and every day to help them and to aid them to overcome things that try to distract them, then they are denying the power and the ability of God in their lives to help them with that. Because if the blood of Jesus that was shed for us and his resurrection was effectual enough to bring about our new life, it can sure cause us and help us to transform our lives on a daily basis yes. if we apply it to our lives. Yes. I said if we apply it to our lives. Yes. And the way you apply that to your life, for example, if you're riding down the road and someone cuts you off, don't be baited to say a few words. <laughs> Don't be baited to throw up the middle digit on your, one of your hands. You understand what I'm saying? See, th this, is where, this is where folks live. See, a lot of times people try to over-spiritualize this thing when you've got you to apply this thing in everyday life. If you're sitting at your desk and somebody just walks up to you and just you know, just lets it all hang out. You, at that point in time, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now I'm talking, you, you say that to yourself, whoa. Hold it. Hold it. And it's at those times that if, if, if listen, if you keep your mouth shut, I said if you keep your mouth shut and, and keep the temper down, mm -hmm. not temperature, but if you keep the temper down, I, listen, I've done this, I know. If you just be quiet, the Holy Spirit has such a way just to speak to you and tell you exactly at that moment how to handle that. Because I have never seen a situation where that if you pour gasoline on a fire, it won't explode. I, I haven't seen that. Because there's just something about gasoline and fire that they just get along real good. <laughs> there's just something about it. So what I'm saying is, is that you have to be the one to diffuse the situation. You have to be the one to take the fire out of the burn. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can do that. Because it seems that things happen so quickly. But see, what you got to understand, too, is that is the bait that is thrown out there at you to make, well, it happened so quick. Well, you still had a choice to make in terms of how you handle that. 
There's, I mean, it, 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 didn't, it doesn't catch God by surprise that things happen. That's why he made provision for everything. There's not a single solitary thing that you can say that you don't have access for provision to. Not a thing. It's just that a lot of times we don't access it or we choose not to access it because we get stuck in our emotions. We get stuck in our quote unquote habits. We get stuck in things that we're used to doing. Well, I used to act that way or I used to respond that way. Well, you're not used to that now. You're not who you used to be, whether you realize it or not. I'm telling you, you're not. So stop acting like you are. Embrace the word of God. Embrace the power that he's given you to live each and every day victoriously. Yes. Our lives each and every day can be free of stress. Amen. They can be free from worry. They can be free from strife. They can be. We have to choose to make sure that that happens. We have to. We have to mortify the deeds of our flesh. And that word mortify means to kill. Every time something happens and the flesh tries to rise up, get down. No, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Did you hear what I said? I said we're not, we're not doing that. Just because someone has their hand on their hip and they're shaking their head doesn't mean that you need to be doing the same thing. <laughs> Y'all laughing like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you have got to make sure that you embrace the power of God in your life each and every day. You've got to do it. <laughs> it, no, you can't say God do it. No, no, no. You have got to do it. Amen. <laughs> now I'm gonna I'm gonna close with this, just to just to show you how pride plays a part in all this. Pride will prevent you from dealing with truth. It hardens your heart <clears throat> and dims the eyes of your understanding. It causes you to view yourself as the victim. This is not what God wants for us. Even if you, I said this before, even if you were mis mistreated, you do not have the right to hold on to offense. Amen? Amen. Now, we're going to read uh, 2 Kings chapter 5 beginning at verse 1 down to, to 14. Most of you are, are probably familiar with this story, but it has to do with Naaman and the prophet Elisha. And again, like I said, I'm closing with this. Let me begin reading at verse 1. <clears throat> now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. 
Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you rent your clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha, look at this. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Let's see, look at this. But Naaman was wroth. Naaman took offense. <laughs> and went away and said, Behold, look at this. I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Now he had already had in his mind what he thought was going to happen. Like he had the right to tell the Lord how to heal him. <laughs> and now he, he, he came up riding in the man's driveway and going to burn rubber and just, and just leave mad. Not healed. And he went down there to get healed. See how blinding pride can be? See how ignorant pride can be? Anger. We just read, put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, filthy communication out of your mouth. Yeah, I understand he was in the Old Testament, but still he, he had to be obedient to do what the man of God said. Let, let's read on. Are not Abana and Farfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now, I just happened to look at those two rivers that he referred to. They're, they're still there. And they were wider. They were free-flowing. They flowed better. They looked good. They were cleaner. Because the Jordan River flows uh, through Jordan. It, it uh, borders Jordan and Israel, and it flows down to the Dead Sea. And so everything upstream, or everyone upstream, you know, washed their clothes and did all that stuff. And he didn't want to be washing in that. <laughs> he knew something about sweet brown, I guess. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> in verse 12, are not Abana and far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? No, because that's not where he told you to wash. So he turned and went, went away in a rage. And his servants, look at this. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, look at this. If the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. They were saying, really, Naaman? You're going to do that now? Do you want to keep the leprosy? You really, you want to keep the leprosy? Well, you need to go wash. You need to do what the man of God said in verse 14. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Hallelujah. So you see, when we do what the Word of God says, then that obedience can bring about a continual flow of health. Because unlike the folks in the Old Covenant, there was something dramatic that had to happen in order for them <clears throat> to be healed. But with us, we have been given the promise of health now. Mm -hmm. Health is better than healing. Yes. Amen? Amen? Now, you know, healing is, is great, 
and it restores one to the place where they need to be, right? But whenever we understand the fact that the Word of God and based on everything that Jesus did for us, we can walk in continual health. And that's what God wants. And above all, he wants us to always be in the position so that we can minister that to other people. But we can't do that if we have allowed ourselves to walk in offense and strife and all that. It, it, there's just something about the power of God not flowing in a, in a vessel in a, in a situation like that. And we cannot make the excuse of thinking, well, Lord, I would have, but they did this to me. And he's going to say, well, what does that have to do with the price of wheat in Kansas? <laughs> it has nothing to do with what I told you to do. Because whenever you read down in Luke uh, 17, I think it's verse uh, 2 through 5 along in there, the disciples said, they asked this question. Um, Jesus said, well, listen, if your brother sin against you seven times and he return again seven times uh -huh. saying, I repent, then you're forgiven. And then they said, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then he corrected them. He said, listen, faith is not for, for that. Faith is for removing mountains. Yes. Now, it can help you do that, right? So we've got to understand the importance of walking in love and staying in the love of God. We got to, like Paul says, mortify the deeds of the flesh every day. We do it, number one, by, yes, saying what the Word of God says, but we have to join that with doing. In other words, we can't be a hearer and not a doer. We've got to be a hearer and a doer because faith without works is D-E-A-D-D-D, D-D-D. -D -D. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. <clears throat>